There's a new mega can in the can, and it's a special one. Conrad was in Norway. While he was gone, some people with reality issues attempted a coup in Germany. But to take a break from discussing the dissolution of democracy by Nazis and YouTube, we discuss a new movie about end of the world anxiety. It involves yogurt accidents. Everybody. This is Megan's Megan Can. This is our first episode in a little while. I'm joined again by Conrad Ferner, who has been away for a while. Yes, hello. Welcome back. Thanks. How was it? Oh, it was amazing. I went to northern Norway. That sounds really good. You sent me a picture and it was amazing. And then you were like, <laughs> that's just the view out of the airport. <laughs> yeah. Can't even be bothered looking at it because I've seen too much beauty in the last... <laughs> Yeah, it was like that. It was like, because it was, because I, it was just, it was just looking out over the car park and I thought, oh, it's just the car park. And then, then the sun started setting and then there was this sort of, <laughs> like, it, was like a, it was like a vision of God. It was really beautiful. It was like the clouds. Real, like, I think I said to you, like, romantic with a capital R, like you could see, yeah. you know. It was a bit Caspar David Friedrich. The Sturm und Drang people out there wanking over that. <laughs> Having a a, a sublime (laughs) sublime sublime experience. Okay, we're going to talk about what you were doing in Northern Norway in a little bit. What happened while I was away? Did anything (laughs) happen? Well, let's just say I'm not letting you leave ever again. (laughs) It's mental. So there was another one of those COVID protests, which you probably heard about. But this one, like if you thought the last one, if you thought any of these were crazy, they really ratcheted it up a notch. There was like an attempted coup. They tried to storm the Reichstag. <laughs> which I'm laughing at, but it's absolutely terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a lot of really weird people. Did you see any of this? You must have done. Well, I was, yeah, I followed it on Twitter. So they were, they, they stormed the Reichstag. They did. What were they going to do when they got in there? God knows. Apparently get rid of female police right to quote one of the speakers <laughs> who i think directed this at the female police officers who were trying to move them along right. it's like there won't be any more of you when we come to par they'll be back in the home making babies hmm. he didn't say like making babies he was like producing offspring because that was your divine calling uh, uh, there were some stories about like heroic three heroic policemen who attempted to stop them in the tabloid press I and some people were saying think like, I saw something along those lines and I refused yeah. to read it because it would probably make my blood boil. But it was funny because um, that was the police's job was to stop them. You know, like that. that it's like it's like oh, we found three. Can policemen. you imagine if that had been like a Black Lives Matter protest and you'd seen those scenes of people running towards the thing? Yeah, well, it wouldn't have happened, would it? Because the police would have stopped it before anyone started running up the thing. Yeah, the hill. or they would have done what they did for the commemoration of Hanno. Which is ban it altogether. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's not let um, people of colour mourn a horrendous, you know, the six months since a horrendous terrorist attack when tens of people were murdered. Yeah. But by all means, if you want to go and stand really close to people and be ridiculous and spike conspiracy theories and abuse female police officers and try and storm the Reichstag, then they're going to be fine about it. And the police tweet at the end of the day was like, well, you know, it was all like well handled and peaceful. And hmm. it's definitely, it's, it's gone up a notch in terms of like, though there was one tweet from the Berlin police, which was like, one of the people arrested is the author of a vegan cookbook, which <laughs> I thought was like, <laughs> a real dick, but like I don't know who these people are. Well, sort was that of. were they were they because were they promoting the book? Were you supposed to like? Was there, I don't like, know. An that was all. It was completely like it was just a long like you know they do those like update tweets and it was like we've done this and we've closed this street okay. and like people are being arrested. One of the people arrested was the author of a vegan cookbook. Punked. End of tweet. <laughs> <laughs> which is available from all good I don't shops. know how they worked out maybe it's just that vegan kind of thing where even as they're being arrested you know you have to try and like yeah. 
So you can't trust these vegans. It's awful. Um, um, right. But they've definitely gone, like, it's gone definitely very far right, I would say. Would you agree? There's a heavy... There's, but I also think that any... Because there were like quite a lot of mad people there. Well, I, I just think, I that think any... mad is a tricky word because we don't want to imply, you know... Well, okay. Some people are, <laughs> who have, like, genuine mental health issues still manage to, like... Yeah, okay. Have All reasonable right, politics. I won't say I won't, I'll take that back. <laughs> <laughs> but there were people there. But yes, who are who thought that the the the, the, the journalists paid for the far right to show up. Like they, they commissioned far right people to show up. There, yeah. there, were, there were people there who had opinions that were so far out of reality yes. that you can't it's impossible to sort of engage with them on any uh, on any reasonable level. It is level. like poor as as poor Jens Spahn learned not at the protest, but over in his whatever his constituency is. Is it over in Nordrhein-Westfalen? Probably, don't know. Um, sounds about right. <laughs> over there somewhere, <laughs> and yeah, he went up to the sort of like protesters who you know these hmm. whatever they're protesting. I'm not sure. Just the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. That's what they, no they one knows what they're protesting. They, they just screamed at him, like screamed like abuse. For him being gay. Anyway, and it's not- he- this kind of like heavy and it's it's definitely this like QAnon thing, which I only discovered was a thing about two weeks ago. Right. And now my life is just a little bit less. But that's an American thing that has been imported here, right? Apparently so. It's a big thing on the internet. I learned about it through the excellent New York Times podcast, Rabbit Hole. Which, who is who is again? Q- if you want to listen to a podcast that's very professional and well researched, <laughs> do that one. It doesn't have giggling. It's got like a few uh, episodes on QAnon, but it's right. so QAnon. We don't have any booze. Yeah, I just realized. Oh God, that's. I was like, this is even. This is m- why am I more upset than usual? <laughs> right, quickly booze because then I'm going to tell you who QAnon is. Right, and then we're going to okay. talk about something else. Okay, um, good. Because of the nauseating nature of the world, I went with some ginger. Oh, yeah. Because ginger is good for... Good for us, isn't it? (laughs) Well, you don't need an immune system if it's a pandemic, Conrad. Okay. That's how they're getting us. Johnny and ginger or JD and ginger? You can't see this, but I'm holding them on either side of my head like I'm wearing one of those hats, like grinning (laughs) manically. Uh, I love the Johnny. Yeah, I knew you would. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. Um, thank God I remembered. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I wondered why my throat was a bit parched oh in the first Oh, God, I was minutes. like, why? Uh, it was. I was like, this is sore on the vocal cords. That's delicious. Yeah, lovely. Um, I do think a JD and ginger, I mean, it's good, particularly if you've got a mild hangover, which is what I'm currently operating with. Anyway, so QAnon, from what I understand, is an internet... Movement. It started something to do with like Hillary Clinton's emails and people reading like code into it. Hmm. But basically, the idea is that there's a source, Q, close to the president who is revealing the fact that there is a global cabal elite, close to the American government, a global cabal elite who encompasses like loads of different people from like the Obamas to the Clintons to like, I think Oprah. Right. And they run like international pedophile rings and eat children. Okay. And, and, and they're in Germany too. I don't know about the elite, but the people who then believe that this is the, you know, and that Q is, is giving them these messages that then there's loads of people discussing what these messages are, decoding his messages. Hmm. And then calling people to get involved kind of with the the fight because there is now a reckoning coming. And I think Donald Trump is apparently going to lead it. And these are people who are calling everyone else gullible, as I understand it. Yeah, we've all been taken in. Where exactly QAnon meets the sort of pandemic kind of thing, I am unsure. But it's all that same. I mean, you can imagine. Right. It's not difficult to imagine if you think that the Clintons, not that I'm any great fan of the Clintons, believe you me, but do I think they're running an international paedophile ring and then eating children? No, I do not. No, I don't either. That's reassuring. <laughs> 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 anyway, so they're there. They don't then, like the pandemic either. But it's sort of like, because three weeks ago, it was only <laughs> like 20,000 people. And this week, it was more like 40,000 people, wasn't it? I don't it's know. quite a lot more. Oh. And it seems like there's a lot more people are, are kind of joining in. I, I kind of think that the, the Nazis, such as they are, 
because there were a few Nazis there, they must be thinking, is this really... Because we've been doing this for years, that like, any self-respecting Nazi wouldn't hang around with, uh, with like, people, like, people who t- watch the internet too much. Because they've been like, like, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, I think these... And, I, like, and, wait, all, wait, and wait. also, like, we should say, like, there are also people there who are not associated with QAnon or Nazis. <laughs> what are they just... associated with? Just themselves. But when, yes, I'm afraid you are now associated, by the way, if you're listening, because you went on a march with them. Hmm. That's what association is. You get out and you go and you show your solidarity to a cause together. Hmm. You've now associated yourself. Congratulations. Yeah. I'm trying to bring like a, I, I don't know. Like, I don't, baffling, I, isn't it? The world is I just, just baffling. I just don't know. I'm having more booze. Okay. What we thought we would do, because we've sort of, you know, there's lots of other stuff going on. Everything's insane. The Russians yeah. are poisoning people again. It's awful. So maybe what what I would like to do is myself, yourself, and our listeners a little break from current affairs and talk about, for some light relief, the apocalypse. Yeah. Would you like to explain the link between the apocalypse and what you've been up to over the last few weeks? Right, so it's a bit of a long story, but basically... Three years ago, I decided to try and make a film. I know, I'm very excited. <laughs> and uh, I uh, and the it kind of came out of all of this a little bit. And don't it's, ruin it for me. It kind of <laughs> don't make these connections. I'm ignoring. <laughs> it's it's all about like uh, the 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 growing apocalyptic anxiety that many people are feeling. Yeah. And I went out and I I tried to find other people who are feeling this and figure out how they are dealing with it. But in the course of this, because it's it, it's kind of become a film about me dealing with my own apocalyptic anxiety and also in a way dealing with my own like midlife crisis. So it's almost like a, it's like, a, it's basically a film about me. I'm and even more excited now. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, it's, you know, like the, the, I, I kind of, I really like it when um, general, like when there's a, when when you know, like there's a reflection of general art, of a, of, of a, yeah. a, a personal crisis is reflected in the outside world. Yes. There's some kind of there's a, there's something in literature which is related to this. Like when there's something happening and a storm breaks out, and it's and it, at the cli- at the climax of a romantic novel, for example. Yes, pathetic fallacy. That's it. Yes. <laughs> well, that that's sort of so my midlife crisis. Uh, the pathetic fallacy of my middle life crisis is the end of the world. In other words, I think you've slightly reversed that, but or the other way around, yeah. They are complementary. Hmm. So the what? I phrase ha- pathetic fallacy would be implying that you are somehow creating <laughs> the end of the world through the force of your own. Well, I think that one. Well, I'm not saying I'm, I am, but I think that the um, a, a lot of people are through their own anxiety. I think that it, it becomes like I think that. People's anxiety about the end of the world does does like kind of encourage it to happen because if you cause this is what I think like because the, the film started out as a film about preppers like it was going to be a film about you know yeah. like uh, like odd people and preppers and people who and, you know what are they afraid of what 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 do they think is going to happen yeah because we've talked about preppers a lot yeah I'm obsessed with some of your work on preppers <laughs> so um, I like and that was a kind of that you know I wanted to see like what I wanted to kind of be a prepper and see what it would be like to be a prepper and, but I was kind of more interested in like why do they think that why, why what yeah. do they think is going to happen what are they so afraid of and then you kind of realize that when you meet enough of these people that that for them society has, has already collapsed like it's like it's a bit like these QAnon people <laughs> for them if you really think that if you really really think that the world is being ruled by uh, a pedophile ring of evil people then you are, you're already in an, an apocalyptic world yes and I want to be very clear I did really find like the the interviews that they did with some of the QAnon people or one woman that had become slightly disillusioned but not actually disillusioned anyway it's really heartbreaking because like as you say she lost everything in the financial crisis and then um in one of the hurricanes as well she had nothing yeah and the banks just there's no way within our current capitalist system within the american banking system that she was ever ever going to get herself out of a terrible situation so and she really believes that all of this they really believe that these children are being killed and they're really upset about it and it's awful and you're right it is apocalyptic, and and I think that that is 
that is almost like if the state doesn't help you if there's no help from society and uh then why would you believe in society why why would you believe that the that you're not on your own like the, 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 there's a, there's a kind of yeah. um that uh, and then and that kind of uh, and enough people if enough people feel like this then that kind of accelerates the this this uh this sort of decline of everything this sort of crumbling of the social connections yeah because why would you go and wear a mask and follow corona measures if you've literally lost all faith in the government entirely like yeah. i i can kind of understand it so that is kind of the first part of the movie is like, like it's about the first 20 minutes is me kind of learning survival tactics by going out I into cannot, the... I have not been so excited <laughs> by the release and of I the go... film <laughs> in a while. So I go, I do, I do a, I, I went on a survival weekend and I filmed a little bit of that and I learned how to like make a fire and use a bow and arrow. And, uh, and then I, I made a prepper in Cologne who is like, he's not a, a cute Anon person, but he's not far off. He's definitely... Not far, he's creeping into that <laughs> Venn diagram. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, he he told me things that I th- it was a, it was a very weird situation where I couldn't tell how much of what he was saying was real and a lot a lot of things he was telling me because he could he told me things like he could he could control CIA satellites like he and he might and he did show me like it's it's not that outlandish like because there were a lot of disused satellites like okay, from the six okay, that were spinning okay. around and he reckons that he could access some disused satellites and use them for his satellite phone. And he showed me that he successfully had a satellite phone. Like, he, I could see he had a satellite phone. How he f- set that up, I don't know. But he kind of said things like All that. All right, okay. And he's talked about how he's got an island where he, him and his community... Don't get too pe- many spoilers away. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> so he kind of talks about this. And then... Um, so that was kind of the first bit of the film. And then I went to America last year. And then I kind of met people who... Well, actually, before I went to America, I should talk about the, the Extinction Rebellion. Because I went to Extinction Rebellion... Yeah, last year the, where it's launched and they're doing a lot of stuff right now at the moment because they are like it's in the name right extinction yeah. I think they really think that something is happening that is that there is a, the, the system is unsustainable right so they're like what you would call like kind of like a more rational version of the of the of the yeah. of, of, of preppers of the kind of right wing people who think that, that there's a big conspiracy they would say like the system is failing and is uh the longer we're just we're, we're basically driving a bus over the edge of a cliff yes full of people you know and yes. that's the kind of and, and, the, and the cliff being the climate crisis yeah and this is right. the the weird thing that i noticed when i'm sort of listening to these like and i i wonder if you kind of notice this too like when we get to the really extreme ones like the the preppers in far right and QAnon, it's not that the underlying concerns are not invalid right the the banking system is fucked like we shouldn't probably trust politicians certainly not the Clintons yeah but it's like the lens then suddenly somehow gets distorted and just like it's hard to know what to believe I I and yeah particularly if you're having a terrible time and YouTube is speaking to you very rationally anyway so then yeah. you go to America and uh, so, well, before I went to America I went as part of uh, uh, the same weekend as the Extinction Rebellion mm-hmm. started there was a climate psychology alliance conference and i went to that and that was very interesting because this is climate psychology yeah there was this oh it's this little um organization of mainly <coughs> uh, psychotherapists and other people who are just interested and they are they're people who are dealing with like world anxiety like yeah. global anxiety so a lot of people are actually going to therapy now because they have like extreme anxiety about the climate and mm. about the, the state of the planet, and are and it's becoming like a it's be, it's becoming like a personal thing. Like people are people are, exper- are really experiencing yeah. depression. Particularly and, young people, I think as yeah. well. and a lot of activists do. Mm. A lot of people who are you know going out and demonstrating, are, and you know because they believe in it so much, and they feel like that everything they do doesn't help, right? And a lot of those people were helped, by the way, by Extinction Rebellion because Extinction Rebellion is, is a very was a very active um, movement. It's not like Greenpeace. You know, like Greenpeace is just this NGO that does this, you know, yeah. that, that kind of lobbies the governments. But this is this was like these people were out on the streets, and it was like a real movement, and people were like, and it was well organized and it had yeah. a good PR. And they so people were like so a lot of people were like helped by Extinction Rebellion about to do with their anxiety. But anyway, so 
I didn't. Do, I went to Extinction Rebellion, but I didn't like join in that much. I but I did. What I did was interview a lot. Of, like stopping trucks or shutting down. No. Okay. But I I interviewed Jem Bendel as one of the people. He's the he's this guy who wrote a a paper that became a uh, very famous called Positive Deep Adaptation, uh, which which radically affected a lot of the, the way that um, environmentalists think about what we should do. You know. They, it wasn't. It, it was a thing about. It was about how we can't just try to reform. You know, like try to try to stop climate change because we can't stop it. He says. No, we can't have any more green schemes at Volkswagen, can we? Really? No. And he says we have to start talking about how we are actually going to adapt to the idea that he said that within twelve years. So now within ten years, there's going to be like multiple breadbasket failure across Europe. And people are going to be actually hungry. So, and he he kind of came to this conclusion through, you know, reading a lot of the climate science. He's not actually a climate scientist himself, so it's all you know. It's all, other people disagree with him, but he's like that. That was, but that paper that he wrote was sufficiently influential to start its own little. He started his own little mm-hmm. um, forum. A lot of people have joined it, and a lot of people are talking about you know. What they how how they feel about it and what they're going to do what they what mm-hmm. they uh, uh, like it's sort of like a support group yeah. for people who really really think this and so I met some a couple of those people and then I met uh, these uh, two lovely, lovely people in Arizona I went to Arizona and I met the they're called the the uh, Good Grief Network yes uh, they had they had developed a ten step program for how to deal with your own grief as a, as an activist or yeah. anyone you know sort of adapted a little bit adapted from uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and <laughs> sort of how you know like you yeah. kind of, it, it was all to do with like some of the steps were things like um, sitting uh, you know learn to sit with your uh, your your uncertainty and yeah. learn how to rest you know like learn how to uh, accept that you are part of the problem you know learn how to do, it was, it was yeah. all about acceptance yeah it was a bit like the, the stages of grief and things like that it's yeah. like you know it was, it was a lot of psychology the, the the whole thing was like you know like 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 you like feeling like feeling guilt is is like not helpful you know like you can no. a lot of people feel guilty about yeah. you know like taking too many flights and all this stuff like and and the point is that they were saying you know you you've got to f- find out what you need to do to make yourself happy because the world needs people doing what they need to to to, okay. to do right so they're kind of like sounds a, like a good program I might I might have to. Yeah, they're, they're nice people. So yeah, so I met them and I met uh, a man called Guy McPherson, who's also on the uh, a scientist, but also on the extreme end of the mm-hmm. extinction science thing. And he thinks that we've got like five years from now. He thinks like by 2024, everyone's going to be dead. And not only everyone, but all plant and animal species as well. He says that it's, it's over. But In five years? Like a lot of, Like a lot of people don't agree with him. <laughs> He just kind of. Uh, I, I interviewed him. I put. I released it on this um, on our channel. He might have yes, noticed. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah that was I my talk. To him. It okay, because I'm a little bit nervous. I'm sure it'll be but super he, interesting. But, but he was. He, what was interesting <laughs> about him was that I think he went through. He went through all of this mm-hmm. like 20 years ago. Mm. So he was a prepper 20 years ago. He he had. A, he was an. He was a successful academic. You know, he had like a professorship and everything. And he gave it all up. And went to live in New Mexico and had mm-hmm. his own homestead and learned how to make cheese. And he said, and he thought like this, he, he was like really optimistic. He thought like everyone, if everyone does what I do and he wanted to lead by example, you wanted to go and live on the farm, then maybe we can save the planet. And then he decided, oh no, it's not going to work. No. Because, but not because of what everyone else thinks, but because um, of what he calls the, the global dimming effect. The aerosol dimming effect, which is the fact that if we stop pollution, this is this is why he thinks we're all going to be dead in five years. Even if we do what uh, what, what Extinction Rebellion says and ev- what everyone everyone else says, even if we stop all um, carbon emissions and stop our industrial civilization from carrying on mm-hmm. as it is, the lack of aerosols in the air, which is what is the kind of a byproduct of all our pollution will actually make the earth even hotter because those aerosols reflect a lot of the heat away which is true that is that has been noticed like there are okay. there are aerosols in the air that reflect a lot of heat away and he says uh, again this is disputed but a lot of people he says that even if so like we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't 
Okay. And so he said, we'll be dead anyway. Um, Get the magazine. <laughs> but the point Let's party. <laughs> I want to be like on that rooftop in Independence Day. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's the thing, but that that's not why I interviewed him. Why I interviewed him was because kind of like, if you really really believe that, which he does, what do you do with your life? Yeah, he kind of you know that's what was, that's kind of the interview the, was the interview was about. That's what the film the is sort interview. of about. What do you do with your life if you really really think that yeah. we're all, we're all gonna die? So then you went talk, talk to us about Norway, right? So so the last bit of the last bit of the interview, I talked to to a an Indian author called Amitav Ghosh. You spoke to Amitav Gosh, that's very cool. Yeah, I went, I sat in his kitchen. That's you in sat in Amitav? Do you know Amitav Gosh? Yeah. Yeah, well, you spoke to him about him, but I knew the name anyway. Uh, well, I anyway. I think I've I... read one of his books. I have, yeah. Yeah. He's really good. Yeah. Well, Where I'm, were you I'm, in his kitchen? In Brooklyn. He lives in Brooklyn. When? It's last, last uh, He's autumn. He's been speaking to me this whole time, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And you're like, didn't mention that you'd interviewed him. I thought you were just reading his book. No, I did read his book as well. There's this short book called The Great Derangement. Yes, I was going to read it. Yeah, it's good. Anyway, I, read, I interviewed him and he was like, he had like a totally different perspective. And he said like, the, one of the first things he said to me is that you're probably for your film, you've interviewed mainly, you know, white Westerners, mm. which was true, like I had. And uh, which is like, you know, obviously I'm a white Westerner and everyone I know are white Westerners by and large, you know. Yeah. And he said, that's all very well. And I can understand this. I'm sort of summing up. I'm, kind of, I'm paraphrasing Amitav Ghosh. To paraphrase Amitav <laughs> He says, that's all very well. And, it, you know, I can understand that from the perspective of a white Westerner, it must seem like the world is ending. Yeah. Because, But the reason why that is, is because the power is changing. And the, the whole thing with, with, with fossil fuels, power and fossil fuels have always been like totally intertwined. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he and he says like, I don't know anything about the future. This is one of the things I told him about Guy McPherson. He knew about Guy McPherson anyway, but I told him about like all these people who say like, we've got like everything's over, things are ending. And he was like, I don't know anything about the future, but I do know about the past and I know about the present. And I, and I can tell you that, that fossil fuels have always been intertwined with empire and colonialism. And it's the people who from my part of the world are going to suffer the most. He's from India. And he was saying that by the same token, people from my part of the world also have never have never had any certainty to mm. kind of rely on, you know? I've never had anything that we can... Um, the, 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 the upheaval has been like part of our lives yeah. since, for, for years and years. And we've always been like um, uh, oppressed and... Uh, uh, and, and and faced with disaster. Yeah, we've never been without disaster. And he said, like, then uh, as as I left him, he said, you shouldn't finish doing this film uh, without talking to some indigenous people because it's the indigenous people, especially in the Arctic, who are feeling climate change the most. Yeah, yeah. Because the the, the Arctic Circle is, by the way, is heating up twice as fast as everywhere else. Yeah. And especially if you're in Inuit in Canada, your whole your whole society is already collapsed because their whole society was based on ice, and the, the way they lived was based on you know like hunting and mm-hmm. hunting seal and all that stuff. It's all it's all still disappearing extremely quickly there, and yeah. they're all still surviving one way or another. They're still they're still like living, you know. That people people are, are getting on with their lives. They're moving like people in India, like Indian fishermen are learning how to become farmers and everything because there's just things are changing all around us all mm-hmm, the time mm-hmm. and collapsing so anyway i wanted to go to canada to go and fe- meet some inuit people You're not allowed but i wasn't allowed shut. to go to canada canada is shut yeah well i would have had to go into quarantine for two weeks when i got there i just didn't have i wouldn't have the time or money to go and do that so I could have gone and quarantined with my aunt and uncle mind you they're nowhere near the arctic circle <laughs> but they're up in the cottage Oh uh, well, and, and they would so, have loved it. So that didn't happen, and also you can't actually travel to Canada unless you're an, an essential worker or you've got like some reason to go to Canada, or you're Canadian or something. Anyway, uh, so I decided to go to Northern Norway because yeah. those the last indigenous people, well, the only indigenous people in Europe yeah. are in uh, Northern Norway. They're called the Sami people, yeah. and they have I don't like know very much about the Sami people. I have to confess. Yeah, well, they're mainly reindeer herders. That's how they yeah. kind of traditionally made a living. So I went there and uh, I I had a little chat with a Sami shaman woman wow. who read my fortune in a Sami tent. 
And that's, that's, the, that's what I did. That's amazing. But she was just, uh, she was just like a normal lady. Like she, you know, she just, she lived in a house. She didn't live in the tent. She had yeah. a house and she had like, yes. you know, she had a Norwegian husband and like, a, you know, but she was, a, but she, she was kind of like a, they called her a shaman. But I think she was like more of like a, like a like a local agony aunt. Like everyone kind of came to her with problems, and they would she would like that come. That sounds great. I and, want that uh, job. And uh, she read my fortune and everything. So that was in the oh. film. Then. So that was like kind of like that. That's the that's the that's more or less the whole film. Yeah. I I have a lot of <laughs> questions. I have one other question that I have been asked <laughs> to ask though from our mutual friend about the and I know you don't want to talk about it, but. Can you tell me briefly about the seed thing? <laughs> so, right. So this was... The, 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 things didn't all go to plan. Sure. When I went to Norway. One thing that happened was I crashed in rental car. Uh, which, you did. And then you like put up a really non-descriptive picture with a joke on Twitter. And everyone was like, are you okay? Well, obviously I was and okay. And you're like, no, f- sort of, maybe. <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> I would. I was just. I was standing in the picture. I would have. If I was not okay, I wouldn't have been standing in the picture. I know, but I was fine. Still, it's like my my dad calls me up and says, "I don't want you to panic," <laughs> but by which point my heart rate has got like quadrupled. I'm like, ah. Oh. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I I I did. Uh, I was going very slowly. I was trying to stop a yogurt. It was a embarrassing situation. You. Well, I'm afraid <laughs> you're going to have to. You were trying to stop a yogurt. A yogurt my, from what? co-driver well my passenger the passenger at that moment was the cameraman oh. he he was eating a yogurt as he is wont to do he loves his yogurts and he put one on the dashboard i <laughs> did not notice that he'd put a, a yogurt on the dashboard right and he did not notice that i was about to drive off because i i was gonna stop there for a moment but then i saw someone was coming up behind me so, so I decided to. Ironically. So I decided to. I thought I better get out of this driveway. So I started turning the wheel, and driving, turning to the right, <laughs> and the yogurt. If you can imagine, you know, like in westerns, when a barman slides a beer <laughs> across, <laughs> across to someone. You're like, you know, here's your beer, and he sl- like slide so it. Across. Sorry, this is just so funny. <laughs> uh, so I was like. And, and the yogurt started sliding across and I was like, oh shit, it's going to fall. And then I had one, I had my left arm out to try and stop the yogurt, but my right arm was still on the steering wheel, <laughs> turning the wheel, turning the in, out into the road. And um, I just sort of did a kind of a, what you would call a U-turn <laughs> into a ditch. But I wasn't like I was going really fast. I went like, you know, I just, I don't, I was still in first oh, gear. No. I was still just going out. And okay, I, you poor thing. And I, uh, and it, we ended up in the ditch. It happened very quickly. I mean, yeah. it's like, these things happen very quickly. And so it was very embarrassing. What was most embarrassing is that I did not know this, but there was a law in Norway, which is that um, if you see any kind of road accident, you have to stop and ask how you are, how, if everyone's okay. Like, like, so like all these Norwegian people were stopping and you realize like, fine. There's a thing with a yogurt, <laughs> no, but it's like, yeah. oh. It, ha- like, it happened. Oh, you but... poor thing, because I know you slightly damaged that rental car. We were stuck, yeah, we were stuck. And we had to get all, them. you know, probably would have been cheaper to pay for some cleaning of the yogurt. Ultimately. It would have been fine if I just let the yogurt slide onto my lap. That would have been fine. But no, I decided to try and stop the yogurt and, uh, and, and, and damage the car. What I decided to do instead was to drive the car into a ditch. <laughs> yeah. Presumably dislodging the yogurt as well. Uh, yeah, it tipped over a little bit, but I didn't stay. Like, what would have been worse, what would have been a worry, is if it, if it had tipped over and had gone into the, into the, you know, the ventilation system that's on the top of the, the dashboard. Whatever the air... That air, wouldn't have been ideal. Because it would have Don't been... Don't put yogurts on dashboards, yeah. I think. Um, but the seeds... I have to hear about them because <laughs> okay. it sounds fascinating. Well, that was the w- one disaster. And the other disaster was that I did not actually make it to Svalbard where the seed vault is, but my cameraman did. I won't go. It's too boring to go into why that happened. But anyway, it was really annoying. And it I didn't was, involve yogurt. It though. didn't involve yogurt. <laughs> and he went, we, we went to the... Well, the, the, there's not really a story to tell. It's just on Svalbard. But what is it? You don't know about it. No, I don't know oh. anything. 
Oh, they. It I was a few years ago. I didn't know basically who was in power in government until you started telling me things. Do you think I know about <laughs> seeds in northern fucking Norway? Oh, the, it's who called did? the Global Seed Vault. It's um, it's a. Uh, they, they, I guess like well, maybe five or ten years ago they they opened it, and it's supposed to store all the world's seeds. If you have a seed that no one else has. Oh, you can, that's you can, just like any seed. I could go no. to Norway. I'm like, I've got, I've got one for you, lads. And they're like, is it oh. a rare? And I'm like, no, I just find it. I wanted to come. I'm here. No. I didn't bring you on it. No, no. Yeah, and it's for it's it's to, it's like it's supposed to be an insurance policy mm. for humanity, mm. um, in case of a climate catastrophe. Because because one of the things that's going to happen is that you know we're not going to be able to grow certain types of food in certain climates, and they have this. They've built a seed vault. It's like a bank. But the ironic thing is, they built it in, on Svalbard for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's very remote, and the other one is that it's it's sort of semi-autonomous. There's, it's a demilitarized zone. Um, it's, it officially belongs to Norway, but other countries have access to it. So it has a kind of a, a strange. It has a kind oh, of strange I legal. See some status. kind of thing that's going to play out here, but we'll just. <laughs> it's going to be fine. I'm happy the seeds are there. I. But it is in the Arctic Circle, and the Arctic Circle is, as we said, was like really affected by climate change. And one of the things that happens is, it's there was a story a few years ago, which is, has been disputed that it's it's become structurally unsafe because of climate change, because um, so the seeds are gonna yeah, but it's not really like a part of it was flooded a while ago, but not the, worry about not the bit with the now. not with the seeds in it. There was a there was a kind of there's a whole the, the, the thing that gets reported in the international news is not often the thing that's actually happening yes, no, in, in certain places. OK, but okay. it was reported that the um, the seed vault was flooded, which did happen, but not the bit with all the seeds in it. And it's still okay, a safe okay, place to put okay. seeds. So like they had a bit of a leak in like the staff room or something. <laughs> something like, like that. Yeah. Mopping yeah. it up. And uh, but it's an interesting place, Valbard. It's, uh, it's just, I really, really wish I'd gone because um, the, the only maybe we can go we can bring them some megas yeah. and they, they can have, show us around there's a, another story about Svalbard is that it's the only place where the polar bears outnumber people although that is also not not really sure if that's true there's about there's only like 3,000 people there there's a tiny little town that's a lot of polar bears uh, but there's a lot of, it's a big island it's a really big island but there are about 3,000 people. You're not going to be able to go up and like touch them or anything, are you? No, in L- fact... Little cuddle, they're definitely... quite dangerous, aren't they? <laughs> in fact, uh, while we were, while my cameraman was there... Oh, God, what has he done now? Well, the day He's after he came... He's really ca- he... at them. <laughs> the day after he <laughs> came back... somebody else. They had the first polar bear-related fatality. The first person was uh, killed by a polar bear in about, I want to say, 15 years, 20 years. But it just happened... The day after my cameraman came back, they were camping because oh. they're apparently they're well they get they because they just wander around the island and if yeah, they're bears hungry, are dangerous, you and know. And if they're bears, hungry, uh, yeah. they will come into the town. Yeah, and polar um, bears, I think, will go after humans for food. I think I've heard that about them. Unlike other kinds of bears, which just attack because you've like yeah they're been really an idiot yeah. or got between there and their babies or whatever. Yeah. So uh, I, there was a fa- there was I a think, polar bear fatality. I think we should go. I think we should do Megan. Megan's oh, Mega Can on tour. It would make me feel I better. Will, I don't. I don't think I've ever eaten a yogurt in a car, so I'm already. <laughs> I don't know how to operate a camera, so I don't know if those two things even out for you. But I think it would be fun, and I would really like to see a polar bear. Also, do they have the Northern Lights up there? Probably. Oh yeah, I saw Northern Lights in Norway. They have them. You haven't told me. You know that the seeing the aurora borealis is the one thing on my bucket list. Oh. That's Once I can short... do that, I can just die. Like the polar bears can come for oh. me. I'm happy. Well, you can go. Yeah. Is that, is that the only thing? Is that it's the one? only thing on my bucket list. And it's not I really will... a list then, is it? It's just a, a point. It's just a list of one. It's still my bucket <laughs> list. It's okay. more like the. it's defined by the fact that it's a list of things that I need to do before I die. Not okay. because it's a list of things. Like there's just one yeah. thing on the list. Well, I saw what happened was it was still a bit earlier in the year to see them properly. So I did, but uh, basically, I, but I did. Uh, I went out in. We went out. It was on the last night, and we were in the in northern Norway. And um, there was like a like a really bored Hungarian man on the on reception at night, and he said, "Oh, you want to see the northern lights? They're just out in the car park." And we went out, and then um, you could just sort of. It was still like because you can. You, you, the best time to see them is like November, December. 
when Ooh, it's... Oh, that's going to be very cold. And there's no sunlight anyway. The sun doesn't come up in those uh, uh, then. And and he said that in those times, it's like the whole sky is green and purple. I would just like, I don't, I, yeah. But when I saw it, it was like, a, there was like a ghostly wisp in the mm. sky and you could see that it was, and it was moving like a curtain in the wind. I once in the breeze. thought that I'd seen them with my friend Lena. Uh, we were like doing the horses late one, like it was dark in Ireland one night. We were like 10 and we were so excited. And we went and got my granny who weirdly was also like, yes, I think that might be the Northern Lights. Yeah. Um, which is concerning because we were 10, but she was like a grown woman. Uh, no, neighbouring town had got one of those like laser things <laughs> that were really popular <laughs> in the late the 90s. Smoke. Coming up to like the millennium to do to do that. Yeah, but that I that think that's what amazing. it looks. That, I think that's what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, it was. It definitely doesn't look. I can tell you a hundred percent now. It does not look like the laser show of Dungannon, Northern Ireland, <laughs> County Tyrone, circa. 1999 that is not no one is traveling to see that but that sounds yeah and they, i'm sorry you didn't get to see the seeds but you did get to see the northern lights in that's very cool and have your fortune told which i'm uh, interested yeah. to hear about but i can see that in the film maybe can i yeah hopefully that'll be in the film so when will we do we not do we when will we see the film i don't know like someone's got to buy it can someone buy Conrad's film, please? Please. I mean, I'll do a. We'll probably do a premiere at some point, but we're going to send it to all the film festivals. I've never been to a film premiere. I'll be too excited. Oh. I, I feel like it's going to be disappointing for you now, but it's going to be. Like, How you know. could it be disappointing? It'll be you on a big screen, and of Northern Lights. And polar bears. No, and no, like, lies. I couldn't see them through the camera. We tried to film them, but it didn't, I can imagine them. them. I, I took a picture of my f- mobile phone, and you can, if you zoom right in, you can see this sort of green thing. But you can't. Well, it's really hard. Even in a photo, you can't capture the. I know, the way I they, know, because I've ripple. seen like the really, you know, when you have like a really beautiful like moon rising or something, and I take yeah. out my phone, and it looks like a ping pong ball swimming in <laughs> dust. It looks shite. Yeah, because they. Yeah. Another question. So. Are you getting any closer to answering the kind of existential question that you have set? Well, what for the I will film, say the, is... The, if the world is going to end and when... Or, or the world as we know it, if the apocalypse is coming, the collapse of everything that we know, what, what do we do with our lives? Just, you know, be yourself. Find out what you like to do. <laughs> it's not very... Like, the thing is, you don't... Someone wrote some who who was it who wrote this? Oh yeah. The um the, the, the Dark Mountain Manifesto. There was this Dark Mountain uh, group of writers and things. And the first line of their manifesto, this this the, they, they kind of deal with all this kind of okay. anxiety and and they the part of the Dark Mountain project is to um come up with a new kind of literature that is faces, you know, uh, change in a in a more radical way of change and disaster and death in a more radical way okay the first line of that is that um i'm probably going to get it wrong but basically people who have witnessed like extreme social collapse firsthand what they don't talk about is like having any major insights about human life and human existence but what they do talk about is that it is very easy to die okay and the title of your film we're all going to die. Okay. The point I'm is... I'm sim... Yes. The point is, like, life is short, you know? That's the point, really. Yeah. And you've got to just... I, I has, the doing this film has made me real, made me feel a little bit less anxious because Good. I've met all these people who are dealing with it in, you know, like facing it in a certain way. Yeah. I really, and, um, really am genuinely, like, looking forward to seeing this for, obviously, because it's a film that you're making. And I think it'll be great but also like from that thing because i think climate anxiety is something that i deal with a lot it's something that my students are dealing with a lot Mm. i've been listening to a new podcast um about the fall of ancient civilizations and i'm finding it from that perspective enormously comforting exactly yeah yeah you know this is a more global scale but 
when you were in the Bronze Age, the world that you knew, as far as you understood the world, collapsed. Mm. We're, you know, not so much that I think that we're going to go on and things are going to be fine. We're ever going to rebuild the world to this thing. But it's more just like, I feel really bad that we would be like the generation to fuck it up that much. But there's been loads of fuck ups. It's been one after the other. We're just might be the last one. Hmm. Well, you, we did our best. We absolutely didn't. If there's one <laughs> thing that this podcast has shown me, very, very few people. Everyone's trying. Everyone's trying. No. <laughs> Okay, they're not, maybe then. <laughs> no. Okay. But some of us are. Some of us are trying, yeah. Or some people are some of the time. Hmm. I guess that's the thing. Or all of us are some of the time. I don't know. I'm really excited to see your film. <laughs> Can someone buy it, please? It's called We're All Going to Die, which I think is a highly marketable title. <laughs> and it deals with... Yeah, I'm excited. Okay. Will we have a premiere? Yeah. Can I wear a dress? Will it be a red carpet? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. We'll have to um, talk to the backers. Talk to, I'll, I'll talk to your backers. I should be your... I should not. I'm not good at getting <laughs> money for anything. I'm just going to be like a weird drunk girl. Thank you very much for uh, telling us about your film. Thanks and for having me on It was much more podcast. fun than talking. <laughs> Maybe we could just talk about other things <laughs> like, like yeah Make, yeah yeah we could take requests <laughs> yeah anyone's got a request what would you like us to talk about yes could be films i don't know anything about film hmm. but we did talk about sliding doors before we start which i've not seen and you've seen the first eight minutes of so that could be next <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay everybody uh stay safe keep abstand Wear your masks. Yeah. Wash your hands. Have a good time. Bye. Bye.